From childhood up, we have had to conform to a certain social game. And so we are in a constant state of competition. But this is the secret. You can't make a mistake. Welcome, everybody, to Friends of Failure, where we destigmatize failure by sharing the human experience. I'm your host, Sam. This is my co-host, Megan. Hey, yo. And we're both very excited to introduce you to our guest, uh, Liam Naden. How are you doing? Oh, hi, Sam and Megan. I'm great. Thanks. Really excited to be here. Thank you for having me on your show. Absolutely. Uh, we really appre appreciate you coming on. Um, I, I think we're going to have quite a bit of fun with with our conversation today um might even be mind-blowing for us um so what one of the things i i would love for you uh to do is kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and uh and what you do sure well my passion is uncovering the reasons why we get what we do in our life and um, i do that through coaching speaking teaching and also research into uh this very question, you know, why are some people successful and, and other people aren't? And this has really come about from a lot of my own personal experience and interest. And uh, you mentioned about, you know, the topic of your your um, podcast is about failure. Well, I had one of the, I had a big failure in my life in my mid 40s. I went from being a multimillionaire to losing everything. But it was really oh, wow. that experience that has got me on track with understanding a lot more about who we are and how we really do get the results we do. And that's really led me to all the work I'm doing now, on, and which is really helping other people get, get what they want out of their life rather than, than what they don't want, if you like. Uh, that had to be quite the journey for you to experience, right? Uh, going from being a multimillionaire to uh, almost a complete change of direction in your life um are, are you able to kind of speak on to how that came to be yeah well it was a, it was a bit of a strange experience in one way because for most of my life I've really studied success from a really young age I've always been consumed with this idea of how can I be the best that I can be how can I have more achieve more be successful be happy, be rich, however you want to define it. I, I've always wanted more and I've always wanted to be the best that I could be. So that took me throughout my earlier life in, in many, down many different paths, one of which was having my own businesses. So I've always been a person who's had my own businesses. I've had 18 different businesses in my life at last wow. count. And, um, but alongside doing all of that and working really hard and growing and, and, and making money, if you like, and, and creating success, I've always gone down every avenue I could think of and find every opportunity to learn more about myself and how I can achieve more and be better. So I've done everything from studied religion because I was brought up a Christian in my childhood to spirituality, um, psychology, philosophy, and the whole area of personal development or self-help, all of the different things you hear about. I mean, I've been, I went to seminars all over the world. I read all sorts of books on everything from goal setting, motivation, thinking right, you know, how to, how to change your thinking, how to reprogram your subconscious mind, all of these different techniques and ideas on how to, how to be better in your life and how to be a peak performer, if you like. So the thing was, when I lost everything and ended up living on my, in um, my mother's small apartment and sleeping on the sofa in her living room, I thought to myself, how could this have all happened? Because I have so much knowledge. I've studied so many different things and ideas and people and gurus, if you like, been to seminars, done the courses, read the books. How could I have ended up being out of control of my life and losing everything because this certainly wasn't on my goals list this was not on the plan to lose everything so and yet I know all these things I know about goal setting I know about positive thinking I know about how to use my brain and reprogram my subconscious mind and all of those things so why is this happening to me so it really it really puzzled me a lot and anyway what happened after that was that I pulled myself out of the situation obviously I've gradually rebuilt my life and when I came out the other side 
what was happening was a little bit different, actually very different, because I was starting to get on my feet again, and I started to create new businesses, some of which I'm still doing now in, in the sort of coaching area and, and teaching area. So I started, but I started to make really good money again, and, and, and which enabled me to do some of the things I had always wanted to do. And I was starting to live a really good life again. But the thing I noticed, the big difference was I was actually happy. Because before, what I'd done was I'd continually, it was like I was, I was chasing after success. I was always, I was never satisfied. I was always looking for the next thing, the next idea, setting bigger goals, trying to make more money, trying to do more things, push, 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 if you like. And whereas all of that, what that did, yes, I had a lot of success on the outside, but I also had a lot of stress and problems. You know, it was really... It was, it was a life where, if you like, it was almost like a roller coaster where things would go well and then a whole lot of problems would show up. And I think, oh, I've got more problems to deal with. And I, I started to believe what many people have said, which is problems are a natural part of success. That's the price you pay of success. If you want to be successful, if you want to achieve a lot in your life, you have to overcome adversity. You have to, you have to have put up and overcome big challenges in your life. And you have to struggle sometimes. You have to work really hard and you have to be determined and motivated. Now, funnily enough, I found none of that's actually true on a, on a logical and scientific level. But that's what I started to buy into. But afterwards, this new life, if you like, when things were going really well, when I was starting to earn money again and do things that I really enjoyed, the thing that was missing were the problems and the stress. And I remember saying to myself a while later, yeah, this is really great. I'm actually really enjoying things. But if I'm really honest, there's, I really don't have stress in my life. I really don't have problems. And I know that sounds a little bit, you know, oh, what's he on, this guy saying he doesn't have problems or stress in his life. But it was true, really. And it still is. Too. It, it really it still is. Because, you know, the difference was, instead of waking up in the morning dreading opening my email, I'd wake up excited about the day. And I'd go to bed at night and sleep well, rather than you know, not sleeping, worrying about all the problems I had. So whereas I was chasing after success and really pushing and setting bigger goals and noticing I was achieving some of them, not many, and there's a reason for that, which we might talk about as well, but, um, and having all these stress and problems, now things were just falling into place. It was like success was coming to me. People would show up in my life unexpectedly with an opportunity or an idea and I'd act on it and things would work out really well. Or I would come up with an idea and act on it and things would work out really well. Circumstances was almost like coincidences were happening that were in my favor. And all of these good things were happening. And I said to myself, I need to figure out what's, what I'm doing differently. Because there's something I'm doing very differently. I want to make sure I keep doing this. Because whatever I've learned from all of these different things, psychology, spirituality, self-help, religion, whatever it is, I haven't, it obviously didn't really all work for me, but there's something that is working for me that's quite different. And that's what really set me on the path to look at my life and look at life in general in quite a different way and tie it all together and realize that the missing link, which I'm sure we're going to talk about, is this thing we have between our ears, our brain. And that's what I teach people these days. Now, and one follow-up to that, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like kind of a perspective shift in a way that you needed that low or that failure whatever you want to call it to realize the missing pieces and how important now is and being more in the moment does that kind of apply it's it that's what it, it appears like on the surface but what is a perspective shift you're, you're absolutely right it's not the complete picture perspective shift is a big part of it but what changes our perspective about things and what is actually happening when we change our perspective? And it turns out that a shift in perspective is, is a change in the way your biological brain is working. That's what I didn't realize. And um, yeah, that's the key to it. That's The key is to use your brain in a different way. Use your brain in a natural way so that your perspective, and when you do that, your perspective shifts and all of the results you get in your life shift as well. Without it trying to sound too airy fairy this is biological this is this is actual um, physical science if you like at work so yeah, more of I, working with it with the brain yeah using so, it the right way 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and so this is really intriguing because um, we recently got to go to uh, a thing called a uh, podcast movement, which was a convention. Uh, it was nearby. Uh, so we capitalized on it and, and got to experience some really interesting insights. We, we got to listen to uh, these, these two women talk about uh, the functionality of the brain and how the old way of thinking was left and right brain, but the reality is there's four quadrants and they're, they're kind of speaking the same thing that you are of, if you can understand how the brain works and how to use it, then you can apply that to your life, like use your brain as a tool. And so with, with that being said, where would someone start in trying to wrap their head around, hey, most of us, let's say globally, don't have an understanding of the brain correctly. So where, where would we start having the, the correct understanding of, you know, whether it's there's four parts of the brain and how they function, or how do you know that you're using your brain incorrectly, I guess is how I would say it. Okay, well, it's actually quite simple. And the place to start is to understand what your brain actually is. And what you actually are and in fact this question of who are we and why are we here obviously philosophers and all sorts of people have been you know asking that question for as long as we've been around why are we here mm. but on one level we can all agree that there's something very interesting and true about our life and that is we're biological we have a bio we live in a biological body we're having a biological experience we live in a biological living world so if you look at the look at the, at us and the world from a biological perspective, you you need you would ask yourself, so what's the purpose of biological life? How does it work? How does bio, how does how does how does life work? And you realize that, and all of science agrees with this, that life has a purpose. Life is organized in a certain way, and that is with one purpose in mind, and it's wired to do this, and that is to survive to be the best that it can be so that it has the greatest chance for survival because survival is the purpose of all life. That's what it's, that's what it's wired to do is to survive. And, if, and as I just said, the, the way you have the best chance of survival is by being the best that you can be. And this is true for every biological organism, living thing on the planet. It is all striving and being the best that it can be or attempting to be the best that can be because that's its purpose. That gives it the greatest chance of survival. So the next, so when you realize that your biological purpose, as humans, our biological purpose is to strive to be the best, to have, is to strive to survive, and the greatest chance we have of doing that is by being the best that we can be. In other words, our biological purpose is to be the best that we can be, and that doesn't just mean physically, because obviously, when you're physically your best, you have the greatest chance to fight off disease or attackers or recover from injury the most, the, the best. But for humans, it also the best that you can be also means mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. The best you are mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, the greater that you, that you chances you have of survival. Because it's when you're your happiest, which is what that means, you're at your most resourceful, your most loving, your most you you give the most, you you come up with good ideas, you you you're more productive. So in a very real sense, we're here to be the best that we can be, and be happy. In other words, we're here to be happy. That's the, our biological purpose. And the good news is every living thing has been given a machine or a tool or a mechanism to ensure that happens, to ensure that it has the greatest chance of survival. And for every living thing, including us, it's a brain. A brain ex is, a, is literally a machine that exists with only one purpose, and that is to give that organism the greatest chance of survival by ensuring it's the best that it can be. So this is really great news. We've all got this machine that's here to make sure that we're happy and that we're thriving and we're, we're living the best life possible. So the only question comes from that, well, why aren't we? Why aren't we all happy and successful and feeling the best that we can be? In other words, giving ourselves the greatest chance for survival. Well, if you think about the brain as a machine, which is it, it is because it's a, it's a mechanism that has one purpose. It's designed to carry out that single task of making you the best that you can be. Compare it to any other machine. Think about a motor car, for instance. Now, a motor car is just a machine. It has a very specific 
job to do, a task, one thing, which is to take you from where you are to where you want to go. And it's going to do that predictably, reliably, efficiently, and, and enjoyably without stress and, and problems when it's, when it's um, working right. That's what it's designed to do, give you a comfortable ride. But what happens if you don't use it the right way? You create problems. It doesn't work right. And it's the same with every machine. If you don't, if it's not used the right way, it's not going to work properly and it's going to create problems as a result. You know, if you put the wrong fuel in a car or if you put your foot on the handbrake, sorry, on the foot brake and the, the accelerator at the same time and do that for, for 10 hours, <laughs> something's going to give. You're going to end up with a problem, big problems, and things aren't just going to work and they're going to be stressful. So that turns out biologically, that's the same with our life. That if we've got, and I know this sounds hard to believe, but if you think about it from a logical perspective, problems and stress in our life are a sign that somehow we're not using this machine the right way because there's no problems or stress in the rest of nature. We're the only ones who, who are stressed. In fact, we're the only ones living below our potential. The rest of nature is 98% successful. And this is a research has been done or people have talked about this. There's a 2% failure rate, which means that a tree might be planted in the wrong place and it falls over, or there's a storm that washes things away or a drought that you know some animals die. But 98% of nature, if you really look at it, if you observe nature, it's doing exactly what it should do. It's being the best that it can be, whether it's a tree or a plant or an animal, it's all perfect. But humans are 98% unsuccessful. There's only 2% of people who are being the best they can be, who are happy, who are doing really well and, and loving their life, 98% of people, you would say, are not very happy, not very, not feeling that they're being their best. The only difference is we're not using this machine the right way. And the beauty is when you understand how the machine works and you use it the right way, you get the result that it's designed to do, which is to give you the life that you're here for, which is to be the best that you can be. So the first thing to, we really need to do is to understand that's our purpose is to be the best that we can be. It's not, we're not here to struggle. We're not here to have problems. All of those things don't help our biological survival. You know, stress, problems, what do they do? They make you weaker. They give you disease. Mm. They don't help improve your life. So they're not actually a natural part of life, despite all this no pain, no gain, and all these things we've been fed, which again are simply not, tr not true. It's not, the, it's not the same in uh, the rest of nature either. You know, everything is the best that it can be, um, giving itself the greatest chance of survival. It's not struggling. There's life, death, growth, decay, but there's no struggle. So anyway, what, the first important thing is to understand, as I say, that's your purpose is to be the best that you can be. It's actually your purpose to be happy. Secondly, to realize you've got a machine that's designed to do that. That's it's what it's built for. And when you know that, all you need to do is say, right, well, how do I learn how to use it the right way? And right. Um, I've created a model which is based on science. It's interesting you mentioned the four quadrants. I haven't, I'm not sure who was that particular person you were talking about who mentioned, who said there were four quadrants. Uh, I'm, just... I'm, I'm literally going to look up the, the book that is referenced, which is called Whole Brain Living. Uh, and it was written by, hopefully, I don't butcher this, uh, Jill Bolt Taylor. Um, okay. And, and she has like a PhD in neuroscience. Um, right. The 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 two women that referenced it, unfortunately, I can't remember their their names uh, because we saw so many people talk, and I only wrote down so many names. Um, but That's okay. it, it, it but it, it was one of those things where it, it was it created a curiosity of okay, maybe I I can learn more because I think something that really changed for me is. I had I had kind of changed the way I was thinking about a lot of different things. And one of them was, I am not my brain, but I can use my brain. And then I've heard people reference the brain as like a supercomputer. And then they say that, um, you know, your your thoughts and the things that you feed into your brain uh, program your subconscious. And so the subconscious, if, if you're able to shed some light on that, how because you you stated earlier you you figured out how to reprogram the subconscious conscious correct no it's not really about the subconscious at all in fact my model for how the brain works why i asked about the four quadrants is because the model that i've developed which is based on science as well but it actually 
is a model which shows there are four parts to your brain. And the subconscious isn't one of them. These are four physical parts, parts mm -hmm. of your brain that all have a different function. And you need to, and most people, when I explain what the four parts are and, and what they're designed to do, most people, when I do this, they go, oh, I can see instantly now what I'm doing wrong and how I'm using it the wrong way. But, um, you know, and this isn't, this is all based on biological science, which mm -hmm. is the good news because, to be honest, I spent years doing affirmations and subliminal recordings and all of these sorts of things without realizing that it's actually it's actually just quite simple how your brain works. It's even taught in the Bible how your brain works, but we've never really interpreted it that way. So perhaps I can explain this, this model that I have, which, as I say, is based on science. There's lots of technical words I could use, but just, just with like a car, you don't need to know the name of every little wire or bit of metal or whatever it is that's technical name and even exactly what it does but you just need to know the general principles of how a car works how any machine works and what your role is to get it to work the right way what you need to do and it's usually quite simple things with with uh, any machine and it's certainly very simple with our brain because although it is incredibly powerful it actually operates in quite a simple way because we're designed to be able to use it we don't need to do a phd to get our um to know how to use our brain you know it's, it's supposed to be natural but we've we and we'll talk about why we've gone off track with the way we use our brain but a bit later but um we have gone off track so can i get into explaining what the four parts of the brain are with that uh... definitely yeah i'm yeah. curious okay <laughs> yeah First, and yeah and and so this is how you would explain it to to anybody right um, because I, I would imagine that you've you've kind of broken it down so that it, it can be fairly simple. Um, Non-technical. I've taken out all the technical jargon and come up with it with a descriptive terms about how it works. It's very simple. All right. But there hit, is all technical us. jargon attached to it, just so in case people wonder. This isn't just some airy fairy idea. This is <laughs> this is biological science. So any other, anyway, there are four parts to your brain. The first part is what I call the thinking brain. And this okay. is physically located on the top of your head. And what the thinking brain does is it takes every piece of information that you gather from your environment in every moment of your life. So everything you take in through your senses, everything you smell, taste, touch, hear, or see, any thoughts, ideas, any messages, all of this is stored, comes in and is stored in your thinking brain. So your thinking brain is like a big library or database. It's got all your knowledge that have you, you've accumulated in your life in this part of your brain stored there. The second part of your brain is called the feeling brain, the emotional brain. And this is located just below your thinking brain inside your head. It's a couple of physical locations where this, is, this operates from. And as the name suggests, this is purely about directing how you feel, what emotions you feel, whether you feel good or bad. It's all controlled and directed by your emotional brain. The third part of your brain is your survival brain. And this is actually located in the back of your head. And as the name, this is pretty obvious what this part of the brain does as well. It manages everything to do with keeping you alive. So everything to do with all the physical, you know, your breathing, your heart rate, the, um, all your bodily functions, all of these things are managed automatically by your survival brain to keep you alive and keep you functioning at your best, ideally. All right, so this is a survival brain. Now, there's one other thing that the survival brain does, actually, which is part of our survival, and that is the way you're supposed to live your life. If you're living your life being the best that you can be, in other, which means being really happy, means not having problems, it's not being stressed, it's doing all of the things you love to do and feeling that you're in control of your life and that things are going really well. But it very occasionally, you might in your environment be presented with something that's really unexpected and could be a threat to your survival, something that might hurt you there and then. So for instance, in prehistoric times, it was you'd be walking through the forest and a lion might jump out of behind a rock. So the brain, the survival brain, is designed to deal with those things, with those situations. Now, in modern times, of course, these don't happen very often. We don't have lions behind every rock. You know, we're not, we don't even have rocks. <laughs> most of but, um, so, but this is the idea. So perhaps you're walking down the street and someone comes up to you and wants to hit you. I mean, again, it's a bit of an unusual, you know, rare situation for most people. 
But what happens is the survival brain recognizes you, there's a threat to your survival and it activates something called your sympathetic nervous system. That's the most technical I'll get with it. But what that does is it kicks in this response to get rid of this immediate threat. And we sometimes call this the fight, flight, freeze mechanism. You know, so with mm. the lion, for instance, you're going to run away or you might shout out for help or you might stand and fight. But whatever it is, it's a natural reaction. I'm sure everyone knows what I'm talking about, a, re a response to danger. You're not thinking about it. You, you just find yourself reacting to this threat. So this is a really important part of your survival. And this is a mechanism that's activated and used by your survival brain to ensure that you do survive against any of these occasional threats. So that's all perfect. Great. Now, the fourth part of the brain. So we've got the thinking brain, the feeling brain, and the survival brain. The fourth part of the brain, and this has more recently been discovered by science and is being studied and is is being uncovered as existing in a different different places in your brain this is called the creative brain what i call the creative brain so this isn't your thoughts <clears throat> but this is where you get your imagination from your creativity as the name suggests it's where you get those moments of ah just sort of something i've never thought of before what a good idea i should do that or i shouldn't do that it's where you get those gut feelings from where you have this knowingness as whether something is right or not. You know, you, you don't quite know, you don't have the logic, but you go, no, that doesn't feel right. That doesn't seem right, or it, or it does seem right. That I know I'm going to do that. So this is all managed by your creative brain. And your creative brain also manages your motivation. So it's where you feel really motivated to do things. This is the part of your brain that gets you doing the right things and avoiding doing the wrong things. So you don't make mistakes. And you avoid things that could, that if you did do, then they would be a mistake. So you do the right things instead of the wrong things. It also is a, a place, a, a part of your brain that, that has much higher awareness. In other words, you see things for the way they really are. You see the truth about your own life. You see what you should be doing and what you want to be doing. You know what, if you have goals, you know what the right goals are. This is, you have this knowingness about what you should be doing and who you are and the right things happen. And on a very real practical sense, this part of your brain also creates things that, that if you didn't have this level of awareness, you might call them luck, coincidence, synchronicity, and you go, I wonder how that happened. This is all managed by your creative brain. Because remember, this is designed to give you the ideal life, the, you being the best that you can be, so you have the greatest chance for survival. So this is all managed by the creative brain. And the way you're supposed to use your brain is this is the part that you activate virtually all of the time. So we have words for this. Science calls it homeostasis, which is the optimal functioning of the organism, where everything is working perfectly. And this is what happens in the rest of nature, most 98% of the time. So you're in this state also called being in the flow, being in the zone. And I'm sure people probably have had brief experiences of that, where you think things are going really well, things are great, things are working, it's all flowing. I don't know why it's all happening so well, but things are really happening well. That's your natural state. That's you being the best that you can be. That's what your brain is designed to make sure you live your life by. Except for when the lion runs out from behind the, the tree or the rock. I was about to ask, is the barrier that survival brain? Like, do we get stuck too much in that? Of, I don't know, call it anxiety well, or anything like that. Yeah, does, does stress instigate the activation of the survival part of the brain? Exactly right. That's probably the part I, I, I should have clarified a little bit. What actually happens is your emotional brain is looking at your environment in every moment and judging whether it's safe or dangerous. Now, if it sees it's safe, it activates the chemicals that activate your creative brain that make you feel good. You, you say, wow, life is great. But if it sees the lion coming from behind the tree, it activates other chemicals, which tells you there's a threat, a threat or danger. And those chemicals create fear and also stress, worry, and anxiety. So that is the signal, fear, stress, worry, anxiety, is the signal from your brain that you are facing an immediate threat to your survival. That's what your brain is thinking. And what it does then, of course, is that the really interesting thing, and this is so, cru so crucial as to how it all works, is when the brain sees that you have an immediate threat to your survival or something that can harm you, it, it, it sends a message, warning, warning, fear, 
that's the, the signal to activate your survival brain and react against and eliminate that threat or danger. But one of the things that it does, the brain does when it's in that state, is it draws all of the energy it can from every other part of your body, <clears throat> and certainly any unnecessary energy, to use that energy against the threat or the danger. Because you're going to need to run fast to get away from the lion. You're going to need to be really strong and use all of your strength to fight the lion. So it takes, it draws away any energy that's not necessary. Now, where's one part of one source of a lot of energy that's not necessary? Your creative brain. All of those things, your imagination, your resourcefulness, all of the energy that's in that part of your brain, because your brain uses a lot of energy compared to the rest of your body. None of those are necessary when you're fighting a lion. You don't need that. In fact, it could even be harmful. If you're looking at how nice the trees are and you're coming up with some different ideas and being creative, <laughs> the lion's going to eat you, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so none of that is, it's actually harmful to even have that being activated or, or available to you, let alone the energy can be, can be used much more efficiently to help you fight off the lion. So what happens is your survival brain, when that activates this, this mechanism, it shuts down your creative brain and it directs all of your energy to seeing only what is negative in your environment there and then. It's saying, there's the lion. How far away is it? How big are its teeth? How, what, am I, you know, what, what do I need to do? What's that noise in the grass? Are there any other threats or dangers? So it creates a very limited, very narrow and very negative perspective on your environment. And it blocks out all of your resources that are there that can actually create your ideal life, including your ability to solve problems, your ability to see the right thing to do, your ability to be motivated to do the right thing, your ability to create the right circumstances in your life, the ability, your ability to know what you should be doing in your life and what you shouldn't be doing. Mm. All of those things are in your creative brain. And you can see the problem. Most people are running around with their brain telling them there are lions everywhere when there aren't. This mechanism is only designed to be used when there's a lion about to eat you. It's not designed to be used when you see something on the television or when you're having a conversation with somebody because those aren't real threats to your survival, but your brain thinks they are. <clears throat> and the reason it does is because throughout your life, you've been putting stuff in there that makes you, <coughs> excuse me, that makes you think somehow, makes your brain think that it could harm you, that, that the world is dangerous, that your life is, life is dangerous when, when it simply isn't. And this is the biggest problem. This is why people struggle, because they're using the part of the brain that's not designed to solve their problems, that can't solve their problems. It's only there to, to do, react immediately to get rid of a threat. It can't see the big picture about your, of your life. It can't see the right thing to do. It can only react. And the, re and the reason it's doing that is because people are putting things into their brain that make them feel afraid, worried, stressed, anxious. And they don't realize that it's blocking the, the part of their brain that's supposed to run their life from giving them the solution to all their so-called problems. It, so really, at the end of the day, you can see clearly what it is. Fear, anything that makes you feel bad, anything that makes you feel stressed. Whenever you feel stressed, afraid, worried, anxious all of those things you're in your survival brain state you don't have access to the part of your brain that that can create your ideal life you simply can't do it that's like driving the car with the handbrake on and the and the <clears throat> and everything going wrong it's just not going to it's just not the way it works and it doesn't matter how motivated you are how much you pray how how much positive thinking you try and put in or or how much work you try and how hard you work it's a little bit like somebody coming along to drive a car and never knowing how to drive a car. And they say, I don't know how to drive that. Ah, I know. It's got four wheels. I'll get up from behind and I'll push the car along. I, I'm going, I want to go 100 miles today. So maybe that's the fastest way to do it. So they get behind and they push and they put all their energy and motivation and positive thinking and struggle and push. The car doesn't get very far, if anywhere. And what happens? They you just become exhausted. The person becomes tired. And then the person thinks, still not knowing how the car works, it's me. I'm the problem. I'm not trying hard enough. I'm not, I'm not motivated enough. I'm not determined enough. I'm going to double my efforts. And they try twice as hard. And someone else comes along to them and says, what are you doing? <laughs> and, they, and you're exhausted. Say, the person says, well, I'm trying to get to where I want to go. And they say, don't you know? That's just not the way you do it. 
Right. You're not using the, the machine the right way. And it doesn't matter how, as I say, how justified you feel. It doesn't matter if everyone else is pushing their car as well. You know, you could, you could turn around and say, well, that's what everyone else is doing. And there's all sorts of books being written about how to be more effective at pushing your car, you know, and, and techniques and courses are telling us how to push our car better. But, and then other books are written to say, well, the natural function, you know, it's just normal that a car doesn't go very fast and that it's really hard to, to, to push. And it's just, that's just what way life is. And you, it's unrealistic to expect to get 100 miles in a day. You'd be lucky if you go one and it's going to be really difficult. And we believe all this stuff. But then it only takes one person to come along and say, why is everyone doing it the wrong way? This just doesn't make any sense. And even in the Bible, as I said, it explains how to use our brain the right way. We've just never interpreted that correctly. Yeah. So I, I had several things pop into my head, but I, I think the one that I want to address would be, you know, as you develop an awareness, right? So let's say using the analogy of the car, you develop this awareness of, oh, wait, maybe pushing the car isn't the best way. Maybe this isn't the right way per se. And then you figure out, hey, you get in the car, start it, and it's a machine and it works. So if you develop an awareness of the brain, understanding the, the four parts, right, that, that you explained before, are, and correct me if I'm wrong, but are you saying that once we have an awareness and we start to understand it, are we able to uh, switch on and off the parts of the brain uh, as we please, like once we have a, a proper understanding? Like, Absolutely. Would you be able to, and it's very yeah. simple. And maybe I could quote the Bible. The Bible tells us 360 times, someone actually added up, 360 times in the Bible, uh, three words, what, which are the instruction on how to use your brain the right way. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. It doesn't say try not to worry so much about life. And yes, life's hard. And, but, you know, try, try to reduce your stress levels. Be not afraid. Being afraid is the way you use your brain the wrong way so anything that you allow so it really is as simple as this anything that you allow into your life that makes you feel bad that makes you feel stressed worried and afraid and you have the choice actually when you feel that emotion you are putting your brain into the wrong brain state that will never that, that simply won't allow you to live the life that you're designed to live it's a little bit like if someone comes along and says um, well, the fuel for your car, we've got this new fuel here and it's, 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 it's a lower grade. They don't tell you that, but it's a really low grade of fuel and it's got lots of pollute, you know, um, bad stuff in it that makes the car go really badly and, and not go very well. And, um, and they put a little bit of hydrochloric acid in it as well. And they say to you, this has got hydrochloric acid into it and it's got all these other chemicals and things in it. And you and this is what you need to drive your car with. And you would say to them, what are you talking about? That's not going to make the car work properly. That's only going to damage the car. And they would say to you, oh, but other people are using this. And, and, you'd, and I'll give you a million dollars if you use it. And also, if you're really motivated and you believe and you have faith and you trust and you really try hard, it'll be okay. And, it, you know, it's just normal that the car doesn't go too well anyway. You go, look, I know how a car works. You put the right fuel in and it goes perfectly. And there are no problems, there's no stress. And I don't care who else is using it or whatever anyone else says, I understand that's how the, the car works. It's crazy thinking it any other way. And it's the same with fear and anxiety. When you realize what it's actually doing to you, the pure raw emotion of what you allow to come into your life that makes you feel bad, what it's actually doing to you on a machine level, on a life purpose level, on a biological level, then it doesn't matter what what justification you have you realize I, that's the enemy that's what i ha have to eliminate that's what i have to reduce because it's 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 stopping me from act, from using my creative brain which is there to make sure that i live my best life now obviously if a lion comes along or if someone comes along or you've got an immediate threat you do want that survival instinct to be activated for that purpose but it's not going to solve your problems feeling bad blocks you from solving your problems on a physical biological level and, and we all have I was just gonna say and being locked in that survival mode I imagine it like the input is coming through the levels of the brain you explained it's in that emotion state of like I'm scared I I'm feeling fear then you have the decision right survival 
or creative. Do you recommend or is part of this kind of process challenging that fear? Like, why do I fear this? Is it going to kill me? Is it detrimental? Is it harmful? And then once they get past that, they can go, no, it's not. All right, on to creative. Is it that simple or? Well, it, it really is as simple as just saying um, three things. First, I need to understand how this machine works because when I understand its purpose, because that makes it automatically a lot easier. When you know how a car works, you just say, well, I have to learn to drive it that way. There's no other way to drive it. That's the way I have to do it. So when you understand that fear is the, which includes anxiety, stress, and worry, which are all parts of fear, that's the wrong way to use it. That's the, the, the fuel that's going to push it in the, you know, stop it from working. Then you, you say, well, that's just what I have to do. So the second thing you have to do is say, or you do do is say, what in my life is making me feel bad that I can get rid of? And some of them are little things like switching off that thing that you're watching, that, that news item or that, I don't know, politician or <laughs> news item that's making, that makes you feel bad. You can turn that off. You, you have the choice. You don't have to watch that. Am I in my natural creative state being the best that I can be? Or is my brain pushing me into a survival state where I'm locked into a negative, limited ability only where, where I can only react to a situation that's never going to help me so you can turn off you can end that conversation you can even do things like um, stop you know change the subject when you're talking to somebody when it makes you feel bad because it doesn't matter what's happening on the outside it's what's happening on the inside to you that determines your life it's your react so it's how you react to things if it if it makes you feel bad it's just not going to send your life in the right direction so it could be even getting rid of that, you know, that job that you hate that makes you stressed. Or if you have your own business, getting rid of that employee or letting an employee go who's not in the right job, who's stressing you and them as well. Or selling a part of your business, doing something different, selling your house and go, in a, go and live in a motorhome, whatever it is. You become very, very mindful and very aware that you have to control your what's coming into you and, and to, to make sure now, now people say I can't do that I've got you know I'm married to somebody who makes me feel bad if you understand what's at stake how your machine works that you have this brain designed to make sure you live the best life you possibly can being the greatest person version of yourself that you can possibly be that's what it's there to do that's its sole purpose and it can do that and it will do that if you use it the right way if you realize that's what's at stake, then you have to look very carefully at what's happening in your life that makes you feel bad. And of course, by losing everything, like I did, it was done for me. All of the things that made me feel bad just went. <laughs> this is one of, the, one of the ways I really got onto understanding how this all, all works. And sometimes you might need to start again. And, and you realize, actually, that's the best thing that can happen to you. It was the best thing that happened to me was losing everything because I started afresh using my brain in a different way. So that's the second thing. And that's the most practical thing people can start to do. And when you start to do that, and when you start to see better things happen in your life, when you start to see the world and your life in a different way, because your brain is allowing you to see things in a different way, in a better way, in a more truthful way, then you want to do more of it. You start to see better results and you go, wow, I can see this working. And you become, and it start, and it snowballs, and you become even more mindful of shutting out any negativity, anything that makes you feel bad. You just don't want to know. You know, my partner and I, we go, we now we go to a if we go to a restaurant and we sit down and we and we we measure the energy, not necessarily even consciously, but we were at a restaurant, went to a restaurant the other night, and we just said, this doesn't feel right, does it? Doesn't feel good. So we just got up and left, went around the corner and found a far turned out to be a far nicer restaurant. These are the sorts of things you can do and you need to do when you and when you start to become attuned about how you feel and which part of your brain you're activating, because you do have the choice. And when you understand, as I keep saying, the creative part of your brain, it's going to give you an amazing life if you let it. That's what you're here to have. You're here to have a life of abundance like the rest of nature, not struggle. This is supposed to be an adventure, not a, a painful struggle. And the third thing um, and this is what I teach through a process I call neurostate rebalancing, is you have to look at what's already in the brain because you're blocking out the negativity, 
but you still come up with ne your brain is still making um, connections of, of negative things. It's still relating something negative to your environment because of what you already believe or what it's already been put in there. So you need to start teaching your brain the difference between a real lion and an imaginary one. And that's really important because most people are running around and all they're seeing is lions in their path. All their brain is seeing, all these threats to their survival, and there's nothing. We live in the safest time in history, the best time in history. We should be the happiest people who've ever lived. If you go back 100 years and say to people, you know, in 100 years, or, you know, I'm from 100 years in the future, and these are all the things that I can do. I can talk to anybody in the world instantly. I can have fresh water at, a, at the press of a button. I can have any food I want in the world really easily. I can do any. They go, wow, you must be incredibly happy being able to do all those things. But we're not, are we? We're the opposite. People are stressed more than they've ever been. And why? Simply because we don't understand how our brain works. And we've allowed other people or this outside, these influences to make us think that this is the, that life is bad, life is hard, life is stressful. You know, you do have to struggle. You do have to overcome challenges. We've been taught that this is all true. But it's not on any, any physical, biological or practical or logical level true at all. I think it's it's interesting too because there's a conditioning that happens to us as people that I think puts us in from this the day place we're born. Yeah, from the day we're born, right? And more and more people are paying attention to that. Something that that changed my life in the last few years was taking responsibility of developing myself, right? Um, outside of the, you know, uh, let's say conditioning that was probably there since day one. And it's not an easy thing, right? It takes work. And the reason I bring that up, um, like you're, you're going to have times where you succeed and then you're going to have times where you fail. And, and that's kind of like what we talk about is whenever you change how you think about failure being a tool and not a, you know, it's not about being embarrassed or it, it doesn't, or there, there should something to you, fear like just right on like that point. yeah yeah so like if you're afraid of failure you're gonna probably try to avoid it because survival reigns like we got to get away from it or kill it and and the reality is you know the more i embrace going into things that that make me uncomfortable and do allow me to stretch myself and in, into a point where i fail and i have to kind of get back up and figure it out um i do find more fulfillment in my life but my, my point is, is that as you were talking, I was thinking about how a couple of those things have changed where I do find myself more in the flow state, right? I'm not stressing out about the bill that I have to pay in 25 days or, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily, so I used to watch a lot of horror movies and uh, it's not that I don't like them, but I realized how they were detrimental to my, my mindset. Right. I'm watching these people get chopped up by chainsaws. It's probably not creating a healthy response in my brain of, yeah. you know, wow, there's there's people running around. And even though I know it's a movie and it's not real, it still plays in the brain. Your brain doesn't know the difference. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I do I do appreciate the insight that you you provided today because um, you know, even in some of the things that I was kind of figuring out. Now I have a way of kind of looking at, okay, what part of the brain is activating and why right now? Um, yeah. I, I, I think it's interesting, right? Because I, I would love to uh, hear what, what people initially think whenever you explain this stuff to them, right? Because I'm sure there's a part of them that's almost like rejects it or, or doesn't understand it and then they reject it, right? Well, the more people understand, I hope I'm explaining it clearly, because w when I do explain it clearly, people often go, oh, well, that, that'll make sense. Because mm -hmm. when people understand, you know, all the, one thing I think we need to realize is that you mentioned you have to work on things. We're not actually here designed, if you think you have to work on something or you have to overcome something, behind all of those thoughts is fear, you know, if you actually knew how your brain worked, not you, but one, us, you know, if we Everybody, knew how yeah. our brain worked and you knew that this, this machine was designed to give you absolutely everything 
that's right for you in the right moment at the right time and you will know it and it will happen if you knew that why would you worry about anything you wouldn't and you wouldn't even try and because when you try and work on something you say i need to work on something i need to change this about myself i need to figure this out <clears throat> you don't need to do any of that sort of stuff your your creative brain's already figured it all out it will bring you the perfect information that you need at the perfect time to live your perfect life now it doesn't mean you're not going to be doing anything you are you're going to be probably doing more but you're going to be productive you're going to be creative and you're not trying to figure anything out because figuring stuff out comes from your thinking brain it's using the limited amount of knowledge that you have and you're saying to yourself when you're trying to figure stuff out there are things i don't know that i need to know but that's not you you only need to know what you need to know when you need to know it and that's that will be brought to you by your creative brain if you let it do its job so it's the ultimate and let this is what letting go really means it doesn't mean giving up control it means giving up your fear so that you allow the part of your brain that is in control and should be in control to do its job it's like with a car you don't get in and worry and say this take this is you know the car i'm driving this car but i still have to work at it i'm still perhaps have, going to have to get out every five seconds and check that it's that everything's working right with the engine or i'm going to have to pay attention and and make sure that I, you don't even need to pay attention you can just enjoy the ride because it's the car that's doing the, the job mm -hmm. you're not saying i have to you know i doubt it or i have to figure i have to do something to help it help it get me there you allow it to get you there and you do the right things at the right time to to uh, allow it to do its job so this is the challenge i have because i spent all my life trying to say i have to work on it and i did all sorts of techniques and you know i'd go to a seminar and they'd say do this process or whatever and and you know set set all your goals and write them down in the present tense and put them on a board and do all the all these sorts of things but it's all based all that's based on fear isn't it because if you knew you do you were going to do the perfect thing at the perfect time in every moment you wouldn't need to do any you wouldn't even need to do any of that doesn't mean you don't learn anything but you know that the right information that you need at the right time will come along you will know it and you will assimilate it so it's mm -hmm. a different perspective and that perspective only comes from when you start to use your brain the right way and you get, and you let go and you do allow it to do its job and you are the like the co-creator you're not the one who's trying to 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 figure it out and trying to take the responsibility because <coughs> excuse me the responsibility you know when you're thinking about it trying to work it out that's all using your survival brain which is is not it doesn't have the capability or the purpose to do that it's a different perspective isn't it again it says in the bible do not worry about how you should, how you shall eat drink and what you should should wear this will be, all be provided for you it's provided for the lilies and the fields and the and the plants and look how much more beautiful you are and don't you think you're going to be provided for you will be when you use your creative brain to, that's its job that's what it's there to do i i think you gave us and and everybody listening uh, a lot to ponder on I know, I guarantee you after we get off here, I'll be driving later and my brain's going to be like, think about all these times of like fear and survival. And uh, I'm pretty excited. Um, you know, it, it is, it is something to, to consider because suffering, suffering isn't a end all be all. Like we, I think there, there have been times in my life that I've, I've contemplated that of, you know, why were we put here? What are we trying to achieve? And, you know, there were parts of my brain that was like, hey, through suffering, you can grow and become stronger and, and whatever. Um, but I, I do resonate with what you're saying in terms of, you know, there are obviously real dangers out there, but they're not in your day to day usually, right? And, and you know, an easy one for me would be thinking about, um, you know, after being in a, in a car accident, well, I've, I've been in a couple of different car accidents and I've also had a lot of different training from different uh, professions that I've done in terms of like defensive driving and, and awareness of driving. And so, you know, after being in a car accident, you're a little shaken up. And then all of mm. a sudden, all the cars around you are the enemy because yeah. you don't want to get into a car accident. Right. But that's the survival part of my brain being like, you know, afraid. Well, your brain has made a connection between an experience you've had and real threat so that's right. so now it sees a car it, your brain is 
sees a car as dangerous, doesn't it? Yeah. And but it's not actually, is it? A car is not dangerous. It's just your brain has made that connection and makes it look that way. It's, it's perspective. In other words, everything is perspective. If, what is a problem? What is something that, um, that, is, that is harmful in your life? It's not about what's actually happening. It's about how you feel about what's happening. And, you know, any pro anyone who has a problem in their life, and again, I'm not trying to sound inconsiderate, but when you really think about this, if you have a problem in your life, such as losing everything, like I did, or whatever it is, I can guarantee you there's another person in the world who's experiencing or has experienced exactly that same thing and doesn't see it as a problem, sees it as an opportunity, sees it as a gift, like I, in hindsight, saw my experience. So it's never what actually happens to you that is the problem. It's how you feel about it. So in other words, the definition of a problem is something that makes you feel bad. If it doesn't make you feel bad, it's not a problem. So it's all about your perspective and how you feel. So you can change. Or in other words, you can get your brain to change the perspective and how, and therefore how you will feel about it. You know, it wasn't so long ago that, um, in, you know, in history, when a man was getting his leg sawn off, we'd think, oh, that's absolutely awful. But for the man or the people who are getting their legs sawn off, it was a great gift because the alternative was gangrene was going to, or the disease was going to take over their whole body and they'd die. So they didn't see it as a problem. They thought it was, thought, saw it as the solution. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we'd say, oh, getting your leg chopped, oh, I couldn't think of anything worse. You know, there was a, um, I don't know if you've heard a man called, it's called, calls himself the blind woodsman. You can look I it up love on YouTube. him. Yeah, I watch him. Yeah. Now, he's a man, yeah, exactly. He's a man, I think he tried to kill himself, didn't he, with yeah. a gun, and he, he, he was blind, and he, but he makes things, furniture and things. Now, most people would say that it'd be awful having being blind and trying to make furniture, and for him, it's a blessing, isn't it? And it's all the way he sees things. So does he see it as a problem, being blind? No, he doesn't. And that's the same with his brain that doesn't see it as being a problem. So that's the beauty of when you use your brain the right way. Your perspective changes and you see what are problems in your life and what aren't. And believe me, 99% of what you think are problems, you suddenly realize aren't. They're not going to kill you. The only thing that's a problem is something that's going to harm you or kill you right there and then. And it's never what's on the TV or what someone's talking about. Right. You know, your wife says, I want a divorce, you know, and you get all stressed about it. But really, why would you? Because... In, and you might get relieved, be relieved, in which case it wouldn't be a problem. But it's all you only get stressed because your brain is saying that means that somehow it's a threat to your survival. So everything is about the fears that we have in our life. And everything that makes us feel bad has an underlying fear. And this is one of the things I teach people because most of the time we don't know what we're actually afraid of. We don't know what our brain is afraid of that's kicking in, us into the wrong state, into survival state. But it's so crucial. So you don't need to control what's going on because most people try and do it the other way around. They try and change what's going on in the outside to make them feel better. So they try and, you know, earn, earn a million dollars so that they'll feel better. What they don't realize is that when you feel good, your brain will bring you all of the things that will make you feel even better. And it might not be a million dollars that you think it is. It might be something else, but it will be the perfect thing for you and you'll feel good. And that's the way you're supposed to live, feeling good. I love it. Um, it, it always reminds me of something that I try to remind myself of, which is, you know, change your mind, change your life. Um, I really, uh, again, appreciate you coming out and, and sharing this with us. Um, I, I think there, there might be some people that have some stuff to, to unpack. Um, and I think there might be some people listening to this and, you know, they have the light bulb, right? Um, but, um, unfortunately this is where we have to come to a conclusion for now um and, and i look forward to um looking into to more of what you've uh what you've been doing um with that being said um i i would be very curious for anybody listening right now that uh you know as megan's corner is about to talk about uh if you if you've had anything that in terms of thought that has been instigated and you want to share, I really would love to hear about it because this is one of those things, right. Where, you know, people might be having epiphanies right now and it's like, <laughs> share that, like express it, you know? Um, 
but yeah, uh, I kind of took your thunder, Megan. Yeah, I mean, you already stole <laughs> Megan's corner, so now it's Sam's corner. <laughs> I was going to tell you guys to email us at friendsoffailurepodcast at gmail.com, but Sam kind of did that. So we'll, we'll just leave it there and I'll fight with it later. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then you can easily find us on all socials. We'll also make sure Liam is easy to find in the link below wherever you're watching or listening. 100%. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, you, you already know what it is. Um, the way we love to leave you guys is with something that I think if you really think about it and apply it, um, it kind of changes, you know, perspective. And that's life is, is not happening to you. It's happening for you. Um, so go out there and change your mind. If it's not I'm stronger than you, it's I'm wiser than you, I'm more loving than you, I'm more tolerant than you, I'm more sophisticated than you. It doesn't matter what it is, but this constant competition is going on. This is the secret. This is the secret. can't make a mistake.